Welcome back to the Neighbors Podcast. Today is a good one, you guys. So everybody loves Caitlin Armstrong. She was just on the podcast last week. She's our number one most frequent guest. So she's been on the most of anyone on the Neighbors Podcast. And really, Neighbors wouldn't be what it is without Caitlin. We all know this. She's so fun, all the things. Well, today, you get to meet her husband. So you get to meet the man, the myth, the legend behind the Caitlin Armstrong, or not behind, but you know, next to, Ron Armstrong. He is incredible in his own right. And he had an outfit, just as you would imagine, to live up to Caitlin's infamous outfits on the podcast. But Ron's incredible. He has a a really inspiring testimony that God brought him out of addiction and sexual sin and partying and just a lifestyle that was very much of this world and into a radical transformation, surrendering his life to Jesus and changing everything about everything. And so then he ended up founding a ministry here in the city of Jacksonville called Sponsored by Grace, which then led to opening up now four coffee shops called Grounds of Grace that help employ members from the community where his ministry is, along with funding the ministry itself. So he has so much wisdom and just experience in having ideas and going after them. He's one of the most straight shooting, blunt, You know, he just tells it like it is. He does not shy away from anything. I say it at the end, but he cursed more on this episode than any other episode of this podcast. It wasn't that much, but you know. But he is just, he's such a fun person to talk to, and I think you're going to get a lot out of it. We talk about it at the end, but we want to invite you to an event that we're doing actually at his coffee shop, Grounds of Grace. The Neighbors Podcast is turning one, as we've been talking about, on Friday, August 30th. So from 9 to 11 a.m., we're all going to hang out at the Grounds of Grace in Arlington, and we're just going to drink coffee. There's going to be some jewelry making. We're going to be selling some neighbors merch. And then Caitlin and I are going to be there to see you and meet you and hang out. And it's just going to be a party to celebrate how God has been glorified in a year of the Neighbors Podcast. So I hope you'll join us. Head to our Instagram to get all the details and the address and all that good stuff. But here's my conversation with Ron Armstrong. Okay, today is a special day because we have an Armstrong in the studio, and typically we have Caitlin Armstrong, and today we have her husband, Ron Armstrong. (laughs) Welcome to the Neighbors Podcast, Ron. Thank you. Um, Okay, so Caitlin is kind of famous around here in the Neighbors world. She is definitely a fan favorite, so you have some pretty big shoes to fill, which I heard she was a little stressed about. She was already stressed about me asking you to be on the podcast because she's afraid you'll say something totally off the wall, which you might. Okay. Um, but so you were going to show up today in gym clothes because you didn't know that it was video. <laughs> and then Caitlin got wind of it. And she can be a little controlling. Just a little. A little. And um, so she dressed you today, although you do dress fun in general. But she made you wear this outfit, right? Yeah, totally. I mean, I came home and she was literally like, yeah, you're not wearing that. And then she dressed me and I was like, okay, here I go. <laughs> Which you have on these fabulous purple shoes. And the sock had to be specific. She's known for her socks. So she has you in this bright sock and you have ice cream on your shirt. Yep. I tried my shirt. Didn't work. She said, nope, you're wearing this one. Out the door I went. Which she needs to give you a little bit of a break because you do dress fun. Yeah, I mean, I love dressing fun. I think where it comes from is back in my day, I always tell her, you know, I was an Abercrombie and Fitch model and Jinkos, and I was like, I always would have had you from the very beginning. She's like, oh, God, no. no. <laughs> She's not swayed by Abercrombie no, and Fitch. not at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so Caitlin is this big personality, big energy, big fashion, all the things. She walks in a room, you know she's in the room. 100%. All that. So you might think that she would end up with someone who's very meek and mild, on the shyer, more reserved side, because she is big energy. She did not end up with that kind of person. She ended (laughs) up with you, who matches that energy. How did that come to be? I think, honestly, it was the Lord. Um, But I will always go back to the story. Should we always chuckle about when we're riding to see my, meet my grandma for the first time in Perry, Florida, And I look over, we're driving, and I just made this comment. I was like, you know you're not my type. (laughs) And she chuckles, and she goes back, and she's like, well, you know you weren't my color. Okay. (laughs) And she's like, I like a little chocolate. And I was like, all right, here we go. Okay. All right. And you're like, all right, I guess we're meant to be. Here we go. (laughs) Well, you guys are a great pair, a very powerful force for the kingdom. But this is not about the two of you. And she's had her moment to shine. And now this is your moment to shine, Ron. So, okay, so you founded 
I well, you've had lots of projects. We're specific. We'll talk first about what you're currently doing. Sponsored by Grace and Grounds of Grace. Tell us what those exist to do and how they are related to each other. Yeah, so Sponsored by Grace, we founded that. I founded it in 2018, coming back from Cadeau, Brazil in 2015. So we went to go see our compassion child, uh, Ronaldo, in the hills of Brazil. And so when we saw him for the last day of the trip, I came back home with the reality of like, wow, this is a one point, I think at the time it was a $1.8 billion organization sponsoring 1.3 million kids off of this model that domestically you can sponsor kids and it can go to a great cause. We've seen it firsthand, but we came back home and then five years later, it was like, we look over on our refrigerator and I was like, well, what about kids in local poverty? Mm. And so my wheel started to spin about like, wonder what local poverty for local kids look like. So Sponsored by Grace was formed out of, you know, trying to adapt what Compassion was doing internationally and bring it to a local level here in Jacksonville. Mm, So cool. And then how did Grounds of Grace come out of that? Yeah, so Grounds of Grace, our coffee company, actually started in 2021. So when we started to kind of get on the runway with the nonprofit world, um, Grounds of Grace was an employment avenue. So we were trying to figure out the area that we work in, our kids, you know, the, the saying that we always hear is the streets are always hiring. So Mm -hmm. we see a lot more dead kids than we see kids that in our community actually survive or Mm -hmm. get out of school. And so we were trying to figure out how do we get these kids employment, you know, money in their pocket, quick way to find them an avenue that is just not the streets. Mm -hmm. So one day I came home, I called my wife and here comes our, you know, different personalities. And Mm -hmm. I said, hey, babe, I just bought a school bus. (laughs) And she's like, you did what? And I was like, yeah, we're turning it into a coffee shop for our community. And she's like. Lord, God, how, I mean, it was just but crazy. But that's like a Tuesday in your house. I feel 100%. like you're always coming home with ideas. Yeah, so I show up with this 30-foot white school bus that we bought from the Gosh, military base. That. And then um, just had a dream of turning it into a coffee shop. And we did it within six weeks. And the first year it did $60,000. We employed our kids. Year two mm-hmm. it did one hundred and twenty, And now we have four locations. Wow. So cool. Okay. Ba- coffee shop. So back up before I even was friends with Caitlin and I was working out of Starbucks in Jack's Beach and used to come in, I think almost every day. Was that the one in, in oh, Jack's yeah, Beach? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you would come really, really like five. I feel like you were like one of the first ones there. And you hosted a small group, like a disciple group in that coffee shop. But I didn't really know you at the time, but you were friends with the owner. Tyler. And yeah, Tyler. Okay. And And anyway, you frequented the coffee shop a lot, and now you are this coffee shop (laughs) mob boss. (laughs) That's hilarious. Is that where your love of coffee shops came from? No, I hated coffee. You did? Yes. Did you drink coffee, though? I don't even drink coffee now. You don't drink coffee? No, I drink Celsius. You're kidding. Yes. Wait, so why coffee shops? I think it was just one of those avenues. It was just the vehicle. It was the vehicle. Perfect word. Speaking of vehicles, another story that happened was um, Caitlin was nine months pregnant with your daughter, Jubilee, and you called her and said, no, actually, I think you just showed up in like a sprinter van and said, I think we should buy this van. And she said, can we not make this decision to buy a nine passenger sprinter van when I'm nine months pregnant? <laughs> Which yes. then you you did concede on that one. You yes, returned to the just van. that one. But then you ended up getting a minivan, but you you haven't gotten a Sprinter van. No. I mean, the funniest one that I look back on was even when she was pregnant, I had a meeting one day and I turned my phone on silent and you don't want to mess with a pregnant mom, right? No. So she shows up at the hotel at One Ocean. I'm three hours past my time and she comes blazing in this <laughs> hotel in front of everybody, cussing me out. Get your, in the, <clears throat> you know, and I'm like, uh, oh my gosh, never heard from them again. <laughs> Was she in labor? No, she was. She was pregnant. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, you going MIA for four hours, it kind of (laughs) warrants attention. (laughs) Okay, so that brings us, we're going to come back to Sponsored by Grace and the work you're doing there. But tell us your story. Like, how did you come to know Jesus? People are probably already picking up. You're a very straight shooter. You say, like, you just say some things that you're like, oh, Ron kind of gets away with saying some things. You don't get away with all of it. But, um... You're just, you are such an interesting person. Tell us like how you were raised and how you came to know the Lord. Yeah. So it's very interesting. So my mom was a full-blown alcoholic. My dad was, um, I mean, he's still 63 years old and still smokes meth. And Mm. so I'm a big believer now after coming into faith of generational curses. So 
coming into that, um, you know, that world, having to call 911 on my mom, finding her passed out on the floor, and my dad leaving every night. As a kid. you As a kid. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I was introduced to drugs at the age of 13. Wow. So at 13, um, after being sexually molested, um, I had a lot of trauma. So I was trying to find these outlets to run to. So at age 14 was my first introduction to the crack world. So my neighbor wow. was a well-known in Daytona Beach. He was a well-known crack runner. So I'd slip out of my little one-bedroom trailer at night and go over to his house, and he'd throw me in the car, and we'd go break in all these facilities down in you know these high-rises and steal all this money. And so I started on this trajectory of just wild living. So at 14, though, my mom went missing out of my life. And so mm -hmm. she took off. My dad took off to Texas. So I was on my own at age 15. Wow. So at age 16, I was arrested, um, and the sheriff of Volusia County basically looked at me and said, hey, if you stay here, it's going to be a long run for you. We would highly suggest that you move out. So from there, I uh, contacted my uncle in the panhandle of Florida and lived there for probably about 10 years. Mm. But that's where my drug addiction really ramped up. So I became heavily addicted to crack cocaine, um, ecstasy, got into trafficking drugs from Florida to Georgia, wow. multiple attempts of suicide. And then in that process, I got a phone call from my mom and she was found on life support in West Palm Beach, Florida. So then I thought that that would be my wake up call going down to see my mom hooked up on all this machine. She came out of a well-known uh, biker gang. And wow. so there was a biker gang called Hell's Angels. And so basically she tried to get out, but they beat her out and just left her on the streets and she survived. <clears throat> and so in that, wow. um, <clears throat> excuse me, in that she made this well-known statement, like, I'm going to turn around if you turn around. And so I thought, okay, my mom's making me do this. I'm going to do this for her. I left, I went back and then it just got even worse mm -hmm. for me. So in that process, she went to rehab, found the Lord. And so probably when I was 17 years old, she started calling me every day and telling me about this Jesus dude. And I was like, mom, I don't have time for this. You know, in my little town, I was very well known for the parties that I threw, you know, mm. just hell raising. And so from there, uh, I was up for about four days one day. And then I went to my grandma's house and I said, hey, grandma, I'm done with all this. Like, I need some help. And she said, hey, either you're going to die in this town or you need to get out. And so I started running. So I went from Florida to Georgia to the Carolinas and just tried to get away from it all. Mm. But I didn't. So my addiction kind of followed with me. So it'll do that. It will. And so for the last, you know, the next 15 years, um, it carried with me. And oh. so my dad never really came back around. My mom got saved. She was on this Jesus journey. And then um, after all that stuff, you know, I just got tired. And so then uh, lost my job in 2010 in North Carolina, stole a bunch of company property while I was high. And the CEO showed up and said, hey, either we can press federal charges or we can just call this quits here. And so lost my house, lost my cars, lost my four wheelers. Everything I had was making tons of money and then had nothing. Wow. And so then uh, put out my resume and the guy picked me up here in Jacksonville in 2011. To do what? So I was the youngest superintendent on Mayport Naval Station doing construction projects. Wow. So I came here. My mom was saved, and she would be calling me every day, telling me about this Jesus stuff and blah, blah, blah. I didn't want to hear it. And so came here, worked on the na uh, Naval Station, did incredible jobs, but then just went bar to bar. Uh, I was chasing women, chasing drugs, mm. all the stuff. And then one day I'm on the flight deck of a United States destroyer out here at Mayport Naval Station. And this crane operator comes up and he's like, hey, boy, you want to go to church on Sunday? And I'm like, sure. And what? Yeah. And it was my crane operator that invited me to church. No way. Yeah. And I heard the gospel for the first time. Your mom's also like, uh, excuse me, I've been trying to get you to church. For 10 years. <laughs> for 10 years. Yeah. A crane operator. Crane operator. So you went to church, and so was it one of those things, like, did you just have the radical mm -hmm. transformation where you were hit with the gospel yeah. and you were never the same? Yeah, so I remember that Saturday night, woke up, he was very diligent about picking me up on Sunday, wow. went out to, I think it's called Bricks at the Jack's yeah. Beach, completely just crap face, came home, completely hungover, and then all of a sudden you hear the, the knock on the door. 
And I'm like, oh, freak. <laughs> and so I get up and I'm putting on, I've never been to church before. Did you put on this ice cream shirt? No, I put on like a <laughs> suit. Like I didn't know what I- You went full I'm suit. I'm thinking Catholic tradition. I'm thinking- Sure, you have no, no idea, idea what kind of church, nothing. And so he's like, hey, Ron, I'm here. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And so we go to Beach Church and walk in and I'm just like dumbfounded. And I'm like, and I'll wow. never forget this guy. His name was David, still at Beach Church. He just looked at me and gave me a hug, and I just started crying. I was oh, like, wow. what is going on? And so that was back when Joby Martin first kind of was introduced to Beach, and he gave the gospel message and gave a powerful statement. He's like, hey, if you want to just start over, just stand up. And that I was like, first Sunday you were there? First one. And then I stood up, and I'm just sweating. Wow. And the dude that came with me, he was like, dude, are you okay? And I was like, I don't know what's going on. I'm crying. <laughs> I'm, I'm hungover. Like, <laughs> I'm being saved. Like, I don't even know. <laughs> they feel the same. I don't <laughs> Right. Yeah, I'm just having a really weird out-of-body experience. <laughs> yes. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so then what did life look like then trying to break addictions, all the things? Yeah, so I had, I was coming off of a 15-year porn addiction. I was coming off a 15-year of crack cocaine, ecstasy, wow. and then just drinking every night. I mean, I would drink till I threw up. And wow. so trying to break all of that was just like, there was no way I could do it. But I knew that in that moment, I had to get in a small group. I needed to get surrounded by people, and I just needed to try to make different changes. Yeah. So I wouldn't go to the bars anymore. Um, I found my own place, and so... The crazy thing is I thought that going into Christianity was like, okay, all this is going to get much better. Right. Well, then I was diagnosed with melanoma. And so went through this whole process that I had this fearful, you know, thing about cancer being on my face. So we went to um, a place in Ponte Vedra and they're like, yeah, we're going to have to start you on chemo. And I was like, what, what kind of Christianity stuff is this? Like here and now I got cancer. Right. And so, um, Joby actually contacted the elders and he said, Hey, I need you to go pray over to this young man, Ron Armstrong. And they came with oil to the doctor's office. They all showed wow. up and prayed. And, um, I mean, I'll never forget it. It was like, it just like a huge weight. So then the following week, um, they sent me to another place and it was first coast dermatology. So I went in with all this stuff, and they're like, hey, we're so glad you came and saw us because we have a treatment that we can do. You don't have to do chemo. And it was gone in six weeks. Wow. And so I was like, oh, my gosh. Like, all right, maybe this Christianity thing, maybe, kinda, maybe there's something to here. it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it was just radical journeys, you know, baptized, and then I just felt like I had, you know, the Holy Spirit on me. And mm. it probably took a good year before I would stop drinking, before mm. I'd stop using drugs. And then that's when kind of Caitlin came into my life, and I was like, well, damn, she's hot. She's on fire for the Lord. I got to quit doing some of this stupid stuff. And she's not into any of that stuff. Any of that. She's I, never done a drug. No. She's never drank in her life. No. The craziest thing she does is drink a Coke at 10 p.m. Or like energy drinks when she was 16. No, was yeah. Like, and she doesn't drink coffee either. No. I mean, nothing. Yeah. Yeah, no, she's, she was very on the straight and That's narrow. That I, is where you all are different. 100%. Your backgrounds actually couldn't be more different. Yeah. Her dad was the person arresting you. <laughs> and looking up my police report before I even asked for Obviously, yeah. yeah, doing a full report. Um, wow, that, that's an incredible, there's so many of those details I didn't even know. Uh, what do you feel like looking back at your journey? What are you grateful for in those early days of that radical transformation that you had in your life that looking back, you're like, wow, that actually was God's provision so much. Um, I think for me, like it took me almost 20 years to get over the person that molested me. And mm. so, and it was a family member. So I remember years ago sitting on the couch, I called my mom. I said, Hey mom, can you come over? Caitlin, I need you to sit down. We just need I just need to get this off my chest. And so so for 20 years I held on to this and didn't tell anybody. Mm. And so which made complete sense because the way that I was treating women is sure. be, is because I was living with this root that never got cut. Yeah. And so looking back on it now, like it is so easy for me to forgive somebody. Because mm. the Holy Spirit led me to forgive my family member who did that wow. horrible thing. And so I have experienced something I know I can't do on my own. Mm. And so I think that's also why, you know, the life that I live now, I'm just like, everything's great. <laughs> I can disappear for four hours. Yeah, and right. My pregnant what wife will be what fine. Are you talking about? <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. So 
that does it makes you make so much sense because you do live live with this fervency and urgency for the gospel to be made known and you had this radical transformation and now it's almost like you channeled all of that angst you called yourself a hellraiser you're now like hell raising for Jesus really yeah. <laughs> but like heaven raising i don't know but i don't want to make it cheesy <laughs> christian <laughs> But so then you went on this journey, the kind of a ministry exploration, if you will. Mm. So tell us about that and how you you were probably having to learn so much about Christianity, but also this call to ministry you were yeah. feeling. Yeah. So I had this complete uh, pull. So coming from corporate America, making six figures, great money in construction, had everything I ever wanted. And then meeting Caitlin, it was like, I remember sitting in her nook one day and she's like, hey, I, I don't think you should be doing this anymore. And I'm like, I have no college degree. I just use my hands. And so I quit. I listened wow. to her. And so then I went from making over six figures to 10 bucks an hour in a warehouse in the town center. So then I bounced around trying to figure out my purpose in life. So I went from warehouse, spraying lawns and then random stuff. And then one day, a mentor of mine, he said, hey, you know, the church, 1122, which I was, I'm, I'm still so in love with. But at that time, it was like I was writing emails to people. Hey, can I come clean toilets? Can I just get inside? And uh, my mentor was like, hey, they're building this thrift store. Why don't you just go up there and just sort, you know, sort underwear? I was like, all right, this sounds great. Specifically underwear. There's some stuff in there I found that is just. Oh, oh we can't even talk about it. <laughs> So I show up in 2014, 15, and uh, just serve. And so immediately when I got in there, I met a phenomenal person, Corey Wynn. She's still there today. And just saw just opportunity, organization, management, and my brain just immediately went to work of like, how can I help this? Mm. And so over the course of six months, eight months, just really worked my way up you know, serving part-time, full-time management, running the store and working directly with Corey. And it was just a phenomenal couple years of mm. seeing my dream come to life of being on staff with the church, um, seeing ministry happen in corporate America in the thrift store. But then what was crazier is then in 2017, I was sitting in service one day and I just felt like the Holy Spirit said, Hey, it's time for you to go. Mm. And I was like, what? This doesn't make sense. And so it was just that time to go back out into the corporate life. Wow. And so that's what I did. I came home, told Caitlin, um, you know, resigned and went back out there in the corporate life and took a, a high level job with a janitorial company and did amazing things. And um, yeah, and then 2020 came while running the nonprofit. And then radically, somebody just stepped up and handed me 15 grand and said, hey, you should do this nonprofit thing full time. Wow. Okay, so that's interesting. You started in Hope's Closet, which is where you saw ministry being done on a corporate level, mm -hmm. which is really what you're doing with Grounds of Grace, too, with your mm -hmm. coffee shops. How have you seen—so you have the nonprofit and you have the for-profit that acts as a vehicle to do ministry. So I feel like there are people out there, they have these big dreams of starting these ministries, starting these nonprofits. How have you seen the benefit of starting this business to be the vehicle for ministry in a way that is still purely ministry, even though it's for profit? Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Okay. So I think what people don't realize is in ministry, you still have to make money. Right. It's a business. <laughs> And so what I've learned in ministry is like, you're not going to get rich in ministry. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got to find some different avenues. Sure. And so in the nonprofit world, I didn't, I knew nothing about nonprofit. And so I knew quickly though, you had to go out and find money. You have to raise money. Either it's going to come from grants, individuals, businesses. And in the first year we couldn't find money. And so I had to sit in front of my board and say, Hey, I'm full time now. <laughs> but I can't live off of $20,000 a year. Right. And so what we realized is if we can build a self-sustaining business mm. that then we can pour money back into the nonprofit, we can hire people, it can reach the mission. Yes. It makes sense. And everybody loves coffee. So except you, except me, I, I will push Caitlin. it all day long. <laughs> well, yeah, you love that people love coffee. Oh, 100%. <laughs> like we will take your cup every day. But we realized like, you know, after um, the bus, which was, we started with mobile, well, then just in a year and a half ago, um, you know, we had an incredible family. I think you've had a couple of them on the show. Um, you know, we had the Shatleys. Mm -hmm. They have been one of the biggest supporters to mm -hmm. us. And so 
they helped us build our store. Mm. And so then we had a construction company come and for $368,000, they donated the whole store. Oh my gosh. And so then we went to having a store that was producing income. And then from there, it was like we were getting calls left and right from city officials and authorities. And they're like, hey, can you put one here, here, here? Wow. Well, now we're at, you know, going on five locations. It's like, well, now we have a retaining, you know, almost a half a million dollars that is returning. Okay. So what's been the hardest thing, whether it's sponsored by Grace or Grounds of Grace, what's been the hardest thing about starting this ministry business? I think the ins and outs. So people love to see what's on the outside. Mm. People don't want to get on the inside. Interesting. So Tell us more about that. When you're talking about running a business, you're talking about P&Ls. You're talking about up late at night trying to figure out, do I even take a paycheck because I have to pay my 15 other mm. employees? Um, you know, product, running around the city, finding stuff to supply the need. And then you have customer service. Like, you're building a brand. The minute that someone comes in and, you know, for whatever reason, you might have a bad day. Well, then that person is a Karen and then literally turns around and says, oh, this is the worst coffee shop or the worst ministry I've ever been a part of by one mistake. Mm. And it's not that our employees are the face of it. It's I'm the face of it. Yeah. And so then you've got all the manuals, all the training. You know, now we're building this brand across the city, which we have big goals for, but it's now sustaining it. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so then what's been the best part? Like, what do you feel like God's blown you away on that you could have never planned in your own in your own skill or talent? Yeah, I think it's uh, looking back and knowing that we've raised over a million dollars. Um, we've now have four locations. We've been in a community that many have neglected for generations. Mm. Um, I see death firsthand every <laughs> week. Um, I'm a pastoral figure for the homicide unit, like, I have keys to buildings that I never even thought I would even have access to in mm. my entire life. And so when I actually stop, when that's very, you know, not rare. often, yeah, rare, um, I just have to reflect like, man, all of these places that I'm in or touching or now having a team of 15, 20 people, mm. I never could have done that. And so, yeah, it's like, can you imagine telling your cracked out 16 year old imprisoned self <laughs> that you're going to be running this? I mean, truly, like this corporation with these people, and you're going to be impacting the community, and the police are actually going to be calling you to come help yeah. instead of putting you in handcuffs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's incredible. Can you tell us a few of the, a few of the, I don't want to say like success stories, but just the way that God's moved in and through the community that you guys are in over the years? Just a couple of <clears throat> like firsthand experiences stories yeah so we're in a community that eight years ago the city put out this broadcast said it was the murder capital zip code and it was one of the leading homicided apartment complexes in the city and you ron armstrong saw that and said let's go that's there. where i'm gonna go <laughs> <laughs> so we just knew that if we can stay consistent so this community has seen so many churches so many organizations come go get the photo leave and never come back mm. So they used it as more of this, like, hey, we've done good, but the community has always been on the backside and never been able to use their voice. And so over the course of six years and only missing three days because of a storm, we have seen incredible, whether it's um, transitional housing, people coming off Section 8, government assistance and getting mm. their own home. Uh, we're getting ready to graduate 40-something adults from our community with their high school wow. diplomas. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. We uh, we sponsor over 30 kids um, on a monthly basis. We do all the emergency assistance for that community. Uh, we work with developers in New Jersey and the property management to how do we better this community and redevelop it in a safer and you know more sustainable way for mm. residential living. Um, we host all of our events. Um you know, and then the best part about this whole thing is I'm a big believer that communities should be investing in their own communities, mm. not outsiders like me. And so we have trained our own advocates who live on property mm. to run all the program. And so when I step out and see residents leading their own people, mm. if the door closes on me tomorrow, I know that a program can still run. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. So is it still the top murdered, murderous zip code? Nope. Zip code, it's one of the worst, but we came off the crime map on JSO two years ago. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. I love it. 
So are you, is that the only community that you're in? Yeah, we've been asked by four other communities in Jacksonville. Of course. <laughs> um, we think we've created a model that can really impact communities, but the challenge still to this day is funding. Mm. So we believe, you know, we have a budget of like $560,000 that, you know, employs the people, runs the programs, all that stuff. But in nonprofit, the sustainability is a challenge. So mm -hmm. when you replicate those locations, you're just replicating like, oh, this might be a million. Well, now you go from a million to four million. Sure. But so do you have maybe hopes and goals of one day expanding into other communities or has that kind of been? Yeah. I mean, okay. if the dollar's there, we would love to go. I mean, we know that there's four other apartment complexes that are literally the worst of the city. Mm. Um, no one will go. No one will step foot into but we know that we have created something, which is the biggest thing is trust um, mm. and consistency. And we believe we can go and make an impact. Yeah. Uh, so recently your coffee shop got broken into, which wasn't the first time, right? No. And uh, the video of it, I mean, it's not, <laughs> It's not good, laugh. but it's you kind can, of funny it's because hilarious. we call him, he looks like the Grinch stealing 100%. your generator and yes. he's just like wheeling it out. Um, so ha stuff like that happens to you. I feel like kind of a lot. I feel like you're called into like one time a car ran into the front yeah. of the, like just weird stuff happens to you, which I mean, I feel like it's the enemy trying to, I mean, you have a big target on your back. Yeah. So how do you roll with the punches? Like, how do you, I mean, because even when we talked about it getting broken into, I'm sure there were stressful moments for you. I don't know if there were, but you just seem so... Like, it's going to be okay. Yeah. Like, how do you have that mentality? I think when you see the worst of the worst. So over the <clears throat> over the last six years, I've been in the city morgue. I mm. see death very, you know, very often. Um, I see it happening in front of us. I see it throughout the city. Um, these other things are so little. And so somebody breaks in, okay, what? We're going to lose money. We're going to lose equipment. But when somebody's life is taken, that's mm. a whole other level. When I have to go to a front doorstep with an officer and tell a mom like, Hey, your son was just shot and killed on the street and feel that way. That impacts me more than mm. these other little things. Sure. If that makes sense. Yeah. 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 You just have your perspective is just different now. The things yeah. that you've seen. hundred percent. Why is it so important for every believer to care about, like, this isn't just us watching you go and love people in all of these communities why is it important that every believer cares about what the bible would call the least of these the mm -hmm. people who are in these communities are in low-income areas have needs to be met why is it so important for us all to love them i think uh for me personally it paints this picture to i'll use our community for example i'll never forget that a mother came outside one day and she said hey ron i've never met a christian like you and so when you start diving into that, what does that actually mean? Well, I can't really display what that means to her, but she's seen something different. Mm. She might have been used to, I mean, we got five churches on our road. No one will come to our community. Can you imagine that? Interesting. Yeah. And so I think for me, it's not like raising our hands and saying, oh, look what we're doing over here. We want to encourage you, whether it's the church body or an individual or a business to say, hey, this is 20 minutes from my front doorstep. Mm. And there's an opportunity here because I think a lot of times we can get so comfortable, um, whether the areas we live in, certain sides of town, the jobs we have, success, and we just tend to forget about it. But when you open up the word and you start to read these passages, it's much easier for the believer, which I love international stuff. I love mission trips, been on tons of them. It's easy to go over there and see it but then come home and forget about that it's in your own backyard too. Mm, yeah, that's so good. So for the person listening who maybe they have a similar story to yours and they've just felt disqualified or unequipped to do what they feel that they want to do or that God's calling them to do, what would you tell them? I would say if there's that knit, if that's, if your heart is beating for something, you got to at least explore it. Mm, so for me, it was just an idea. I just remember going into that coffee shop, looking at Tyler and say, hey, would you get behind me if I actually tried this? And he was like, yeah, sure. Mm. Not knowing six years later, it would turn into this what it is now. But it just took for him to say, yeah, man, I believe in you. Mm -hmm. And so if it's anybody, I would just get somebody that's close to you and say, hey, would you mind doing whatever? Like one of the biggest things I love now because of the position I'm in is when somebody comes and says, hey, Ron, do you have... 500 or a thousand dollars to help me start. And I'm like, absolutely. Mm. Or we'll give you a van or whatever. What do you need? And so I just know because of people believed in me, 
we want to now believe mm. in whatever dream you have. Wow, yeah, it's so good. Do you ever, because of everything that's happened to you in your life, do you ever battle the whispers that... <laughs> Is that it? <laughs> when you battle the there whispers... Um, yeah, wh- like what does the enemy try to use against you, and then how do you fight it? So the biggest thing that he always brings up is my past. Sure. Um, There are areas in this city where I first came before I even met my wife, before I had Mm. family, that things happen in this city that I'll drive by and immediately he'll use that and be like, hey, remember when you were there, did that? Mm. And, um, you know, it is a constant fight of not being conformed to the patterns of the lies of the schemes of the enemy, but being transformed by the renewing of my mind. And so I can go to a very dark place very quick. Um, but my, I have a choice. Do I want to stay there or not? And I think for a believer, it's like it may look very successful on the outside, but I'm the type of guy that's going to say, hey, I want to be vulnerable. I want to be transparent. Like the things that are racing in this mind right here mm. are absolutely things that are true. Yeah, for sure. So what is your daily practice of that look like? Like for the person – who feels that stuff creep up and doesn't know how to get out of the dark spot. Like you said, you have a choice. What is, what does that look like practically? Yeah. So I would say probably over the past couple of years, I've had a lot of friends who either have passed away from addiction Mm. or they've went into rehabs or they've just made some choices that, you know, for whatever circumstance may have happened, but they never picked up the phone. So they always thought that I can do this. Mm. I'm at a place in my in my life at 36 years old. I don't want to be saying I got this. I want to pick up the phone to, you know, I have a great group of guys now, whether they're business leaders, entrepreneurs, you know, faith leaders. And I'm very open like, hey, guys, like actually the last one that just happened was I told my wife, I said, hey, don't let me stay up past nine o'clock and watch Netflix. She's like, why? Because my mind, I'll start turning on stuff. Immediately, I'll start watching drug shows mm. or inappropriate stuff, and not like going down a really dark hole, but I'll start There's training. A step in that direction, hundred percent. Yeah. And so then I'll call my buddies the next day and say, "Hey, I need to confess something to you. Like this is what's happening." And they're like, "What can we do to help?" And so for the believer or the non-believer out there that's trying to figure out these tangible steps, you got to have people that you mm. know surround you in it. Yeah, that's really good. So you talked about you know, you broke some generational sin that was passed on to you, addiction specifically, and now you all have three kids. So, Mm -hmm. and especially with you and Caitlin coming from really different backgrounds, her not having that background, but bringing, of course, we all bring junk. We all have junk. Mm -hmm. It might be different junk, but it's all junk. Amen. So how do you now with your three kids, like how do you set them up or what are you doing now to steer them in the direction of a life running after the Lord versus the things that you've experienced. Yeah. So I, I'm a big believer now that in the generational world and curses and all that stuff, bloodlines that we broke it. Um, mm-hmm. God used me and Caitlin to break that, that there was nothing carried into our kids from mm-hmm. pornography, drinking, drugs, anything. And so now it's my oldest eight going to be eight. My middle is going to be, he's seven and then three Jubilee my eight year old's getting to that point of starting to ask questions. Mm-hmm. And so whether it's sex, drugs, drinking, Bobcats, <laughs> Bobcat spiders, <laughs> you know? And so it was a couple of weeks ago, he started asking me like, Hey dad, like what kind of person were you? Or like, mm-hmm. did you ever do any of that? And it was a great opportunity for me to open up and say, you know what? Yeah. These are some of the things mm-hmm. that your father did. And I want to make sure that I point you in the right direction. And so I feel like, um, the older these kids get, it's going to start coming even more. Sure. Yeah. Well, I love how open you guys are with your kids. I mean, that's one thing we have tr- are trying. I mean, our kids are three and one, so we're not really having, like, the deep conversations about our past. But I love how open you are. When your kids ask you a question, you tell them the true, mm-hmm. real answer. You're not trying to sugarcoat anything. Of course, age appropriate, sure. you know, but... I think it's so important that, especially given your experiences, to be able to use, you know, what's an experience if we don't learn from it, to be able to use that to help steer your kids in the right direction of at least them knowing, okay, well, I know that they've been through this before, so even if I'm annoyed at them for saying no to something, a movie or something that they're going to watch, at least knowing, okay, but they've been there, so maybe they do kind of know what they're talking about. I think a little bit, yeah. 
you know, um, which I think is so beautiful. <laughs> okay, so last question. We always know you're cooking up ideas. Uh, you, you're an idea guy. And we actually, for a, a bit there, because my mom is the exact same way as you, and she's been on the podcast before, and there was a bit there where you guys kept meeting up and having these, like, you're going to buy a school, you're going to, these outlandish, no you know, we had to stop you two from meeting. She's supposed to retire. She's doing all these new <laughs> projects in the city of Jacksonville. So we had to cut your relationship off. But, um, okay, so you're an ideas guy. Do you have anything cooking? Any ideas cooking? Yeah, I was mowing the grass yesterday, and I think I want to run for mayor. <laughs> Are you kidding me? No, I mean, I think it was something that... Um, <laughs> oh sorry, gosh. Donna. Um, Donna? You know, I think that maybe that's the in grass. the work. <laughs> just mowing the grass. And, you know, I don't want to say it was the Holy Spirit or if it was just me being me, but I'm going to claim it. Sure. Um, but I think in my world, I have to continue to figure out how do we continue to make change in the city. Um, if we can make change in the city, we can then scale to the nation. And so Come on. if we can take a top rated homicided murder capital apartment complex and completely flip it upside down for the, the gospel, what else can we do? And so I don't know how long that's going to take, but my big goal in the next five years is to have 10 locations for the coffee shop, mm. make sure that the nonprofit is sustainable, obviously loving my wife, my kids all at the same time. But yeah, there's a, there's a lot ahead. Do you feel like Caitlin gives first lady vibes? <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> Well, you've definitely cursed more than any other guest I've had on my podcast. <laughs> um, okay, Ron. Well, I love you. I love your family. Caitlin has been... Honestly, I'm not even saying this. I'm not even building this up to be more than it is. She has single-handedly been one of the biggest gifts in my life when it comes to friendship. And she is easily one of the best friends to people and to me of anyone I've ever met. And um, she has pointed me more to the Lord than any other individual other than my husband ever. And for that, you, by the transitive property of being one with her in marriage, means I also love you so much, <laughs> which I do love you. Amen. Thank and you. I'm just so grateful for your family. I'm grateful for the work you're doing in our city and the awareness you're bringing to stuff that's in our backyard that people honestly either turn a blind eye to or just don't know about. Um, Jacksonville is pretty spread out. And I, at least, like, I didn't know about this community until you started bringing light to it. And the more we can shine light in dark places, the more the gospel gets spread and the more eternities are changed and generational sin is broken and lives are changed forever. And you're a testament to that. And so I just thank you for that. And lastly, we have an exciting thing coming up. I think this episode is coming out on the week that we're having a little collaboration, if you will. Oh, yeah. So Neighbors and Grounds of Grace, we're having a little event on Friday, August 30th that we'd love to invite everybody to, where we're celebrating one year of the Neighbors podcast. Congratulations. Which is so fun. Yeah. I mean, talk about something I just had an idea about. And <laughs> you asked before before we started recording, you said to Wes, so was this her idea and you just came along or was it y'all's idea? And I said, no, this is how everything works in my life. Amen. I have an idea and Wes makes it happen. <laughs> And so, yeah, we can't believe it's been a year. So we're going to go party at Grounds of Grace on August 30th. I think it's from 9 to 11. What's your um, drink? It, oh, yeah, we're going to have a special neighbor's drink. It's very basic because I just couldn't think of anything fun. But it's a iced honey oat milk latte. Okay. Which I feel like is a very popular drink. Yeah, very simple. Yeah, very simple. But I, I, I don't like anything too crazy with coffee. Sure. Uh, and so I hope people come out. We're going to, Caitlin and I are going to be there hanging out with people. We're going to have a little jewelry station and special drink and neighbor's merch and all the all the things. Are you, You're going to be there? I'll be there. With your party shirt on? Whatever she tells me to wear. Oh, you're right. Actually, you should probably wear a neighbor's shirt because I'd be fine. Will you just tell her to let me wear what I want to wear? She, Honestly, she would never listen. If someone told her to wear something, 100%. she would never listen. 100%. She would actually do the exact opposite. 100%. And now she's trying to tell you what to wear. So you got to wear what you want to wear. It's a cult. <laughs> it's a cult. <laughs> All right. The neighbors love you, Ron. Thank you. See ya. <laughs> neighbors is produced by Logger Creative and Taylor Minning. Music by Austin and Lindsay Adamak. Artwork by Wesley Parsons. And motion graphics by Robbie Burns. Every morning, you never shine.